and are you comfortable with your sitting position? And just gently bring your attention back to your breathing. Breathing in, I relax my whole body. Breathing out, I smile to my body. Breathing in, I am aware of the whole Sangha in this hall. Breathing out, I feel supported. Breathing in, I open my eyes. And breathing out, I smile and be in touch with the Sangha around me. How are you? Feeling more relaxed? So tonight I, um, I am here with our five friends who will be sharing with you their very personal experiences about how they practice the five mindfulness trainings. This morning, Sister Truval already shared with us a little bit about the five mindfulness training. So I don't. I think she did um, give us quite uh, some significant information about the five mindfulness trainings and how how wonderful they are. So tonight, I don't feel that I should uh, go so deep uh, or repeat that but just build on what she shared this morning. Um, I really like what she said about, um, about the help that the Buddha already 2,600 years ago already shared with us the, the, the practice to help us to transform our habit energies. But for me, transforming our unwholesome habit energies also go hands in hands like my, uh, the back and the, the palm of my hands, they're go, going together. Transforming the ho- uh, unwholesome habit energies goes hand in hand with um, um, generating and building our good habit energies. So um, the help that the, the Buddha uh, proposed to his um, uh, his uh, latest disciples at that time, you could uh, you could find in a sutra called uh, the the discourse on the white clad um, disciples, and um, based on that we have this uh, mindfulness trainings. Mm. So, so in the beginning, the. Um, uh, the five mindfulness trainings were not called the five mindfulness trainings as, as some of you probably know, but it was called the five precepts. And it goes like no um, killing, no um, stealing, no lying, no sexual misconduct, and uh, no drinking. Mm. So nowadays when you go to some, um, some um, traditional temples, you still see that uh, the five precepts still have been transmitted to people in pretty much the same form. But our teacher, he's, uh, he wants to share this practice with, uh, with people in this um, contemporary society to make it very useful and approachable and accessible to many people as possible. And um, and so he, in, in the, about the 1990s, he started to, to develop um, the precepts into the five mindfulness trainings. And um, 
everything would begin with the um, aware of the suffering caused by this and this, I commit to refrain from this and this, and I want to share my fruit of practice to help other people. So um, when I came across this, uh, these mindfulness trainings, they were in that form. And then in the, in the late 19, sorry, in the late 1980s, um, he, um, he wanted to have further revision on those mindfulness trainings so that it could be more and more appropriate to people, especially young people. And also people across, um, uh, re uh, people across, across faith. And so about 19, sorry, about 2000, I mixed up the time a little bit, but um, it was um, about 2008, 2009, that's when the new, the new revised um, mindfulness trainings were introduced. And it was the result of, um, of uh, many retreats in Plum Village. It was uh, the winter retreat, uh, the Francophone retreat, and the 21-day retreat. Um, the Sangha, the four-four Sanghas, that means lay men, lay women, monastic um, monks and nuns, uh, together with Thai. They had a lot of Dharma sharings about the, how the mindfulness trainings can be upgraded. And in the end, they came up with the version that we have in, 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 in your hand today. So it's always um, useful, um, as Sister um, Druval shared this morning, to use this as a, a mirror, to use the five mindfulness trainings as the mirror, so that we could look in and uh, and check and see and reflect on um, on how we would like to to channel our thinking to channel our actions and to channel our um, um, our speech into the more wholesome direction and um, and actually uh, it is quite um, uh, the five mindfulness trainings, if you have time to read them more carefully, you will see that they help us to touch on very various kind of aspects of life and always know outer than how to direct our thinking, our actions and our um, and our um, speech mm. and um, and so um, for me, I, I find that it is a very effective and proactive way to, um, to practice like um, to avoid the situation where we have, um, um, like what I usually say, if we are, if we, if we are a, a surgeon and we operate a surgery on somebody, and when we finish our operation to come out and our colleague asks us, how was it going? And we say, yeah, the operation was very successful, but the patient actually died. So what I mean is that sometimes we, it is just a small example, sometimes we want to stand our ground and we forget that a relationship between us and somebody is more important. So we win the argument with that person, but our relationship is completely ruined. So that means the patient died on the operation table. And when we practice the five mindfulness trainings like this, we can avoid, uh, avoid to, to come into that sort of situation. And I, um, this morning when Sister Druval gave her, um, gave her um, her Dharma talk, for the first time I understood very clearly what it meant in Vietnamese. I always heard Bồ Tát sở nhân, chúng sanh sở quả. That means the Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are great beings. The Bodhisattvas are always um, concerned and afraid of, um, 
of the conditions and causes, but an average being, human being, so to speak, is more concerned and worried about the consequences. And that means usually we, w we work backward, like this morning Sister Truva said. We, we do something and then we, we will fix the consequences. But if we practice the five mindfulness trainings, we will avoid the consequences. We don't have to go back to fix them. I find that when I live in the monastery, here in Blue Cliff, we only have 20 sisters, but in New Hamlet, we have 60. So we live together in a room maybe with up to six, seven sisters. And um, of course, we have to practice so that we can keep the harmony. And, um, and I find that when I do something and then I cause some hard feelings with my sisters or in myself, I have to spend more time to fix it than I, uh, I uh, um, take a, a proactive uh, approach to, to, to refrain from uttering words or doing something. It's easier for me to do that than to fix it up later because when we live together, can you imagine when we come in and out and long faces and maybe more my face long than my sister because usually they practice better than me, you know. But usually I, I, I always feel very self-conscious and I feel like, oh, I don't know what she's thinking of me. But uh, slowly when I, when I practice the mindfulness trainings, we nuns, we, uh, we have more than 300 trainings. So, but they're all based on these. And so, I find that the more I practice, the more I avoid myself going into those situations. Or if I go into it, I find a way out quicker. So um, I guess um, my tip for you personally is that usually I don't focus so much on my, I do, but I don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> So, not so much on, on, the, on the bad things. So, I, okay, if I have a bad habit energy or unwholesome habit energy I like to transform, then I, I try to not to focus on it so much. I beat myself sometimes if I still run to, to the, the, old, the old way. But, uh, but then I, I find that if I try to develop... Um, based on the, the mindfulness trainings, the wholesome things, um, then slowly, slowly, even though I don't tackle my unwholesome one, then slowly they, they're not so strong anymore. So, um, because sometimes when we focus so much on the negativities of our habit energies, we feel like, okay, this lifetime maybe not enough, maybe next lifetime, <laughs> maybe next lifetime, maybe next lifetime, you know. And, and so, um, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think it's about uh, time that um, I'd like to introduce um, our friends to you. But um, yeah, um, their practice will speak um, by itself, you know. In the beginning, I thought maybe I will to make it a little bit more fun for you by doing this as an app, you know. Like, uh, okay, this is an app. You can download to your uh, store consciousness. And, uh, <laughs> and sorry, you cannot erase it. It's just stay there. <laughs> you can delete. <laughs> so, um, so these guys, they click like, they download it. They click like, so today I will uh, invite them to share with you. And uh, they're brilliant. They click many times, not just once. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, uh, we thought that maybe our friends will, will take turn to share with us their name, where they are from, and uh, a fun fact about them. 
So I will pass my microphone to Dear Thai, dear Sangha, my name is Bradley, and I practice with Wake Up New York in Manhattan. Um, I live in New Jersey, but I work in the city. And my fun fact is I spent a year living in Spain, um, and I'm fluent in Spanish. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alexis. I come from Montreal, Wake Up Montreal. I was part of Wake Up Paris before that because I come from France. And I practice in the Plum Village tradition since the nine last years. And I took the five mindfulness trainings in 2013. And uh, my fun fact. Um, I need chocolate. <laughs> dear beloved teacher, dear friends, my name is Mimi. Um, I live here now, but I'm originally from the New Orleans area. And my fun fact was hard to think about. I had to ask a few people. So um, I think. I'm an old soul in the sense that I really like the Golden Girls. You know that TV show? It's pretty great. Okay. Hello, friends. Um, I'm Luis. Uh, I live in New York City. I practice with Welcome New York. Mm. Fun fact for the longest time when I was a kid, I thought tuna were a very small fish because they could fit in a can. And when I saw a real one, I was like, what? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sofia. So I did the five mindfulness trainings last year with Brother Matt. And um, so my fun fact is my life. <laughs> my whole life. <laughs> Yeah, I just love like new experiences and um, getting to know new countries and people and just diversity of experiences. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, dear friends. So I am very excited to look and look forward to listen to what our friends share. Um, Um, we thought that uh, perhaps we will invite you to um, to observe what's going up in you when um, because before um, our um, our friend share he or she will read the f the one mindfulness training and during that time you can follow the text or you can just listen and you can observe what's What's going, in, what's going up in your mind? What kind of reaction? What kind of thinking? Uh, is that uh, a, um, a, yeah, yeah, I know this for a long time. Uh, or this is something I'm not sure about. Uh, you know, any resistance, anything at all, please just take a mental note on it. And they will give you a few moments to, to register that and just keep that there and at the end we will revisit it. Okay, so I now will invite one sound of the bell we can, so that we all can come back and enjoy our breathing and relax our body and ready to, uh, to, uh, to be together once again with our full presence.
So during the presentation, please, whenever you remember, come back to your breathing and relax your body, even when you are listening. Okay. Dear Thai, dear Sangha, please listen carefully. The first mindfulness training, reverence for life. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I am committed to cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion and learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to support any act of killing in the world, in my thinking, or in my way of life. Seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, I will cultivate openness, non-discrimination, and non-attachment to views in order to transform violence, fanaticism, and dogmatism in myself and in the world. So when we were talking about this mindfulness training, or rather choosing the mindfulness trainings, um, there were two that stuck out to me, but one was taken. <laughs> um, but this one I resonated with um, equally. And there are two parts that po stuck out to me um, in particular in my life. Um, if you look at the training, you can kind of see kind of two aspects of reverence for life. Um, the first being to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. Um, and when I first read this, I was like, okay, I haven't killed anybody, so I'm good. <laughs> um, I'm vegan. I've been vegan for a while, so with animals, I'm like fine too. Um, and plants, I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and minerals, I didn't really understand at the time <laughs> because I wasn't sure how to protect the life of a mineral. Um, but over time and while I was thinking about um, the trainings, each one kind of revealed itself to me in a different way. Um, so for people, for me, it was really important to pay attention to maybe um, the fact that I'm not killing somebody directly, but thinking to myself, what are the ways that I might be um, that I'm not aware of, that I don't really see? Um, and being in touch with certain news events and things happening in the world have made me more aware of that. Um, for example, um, many people might know that child labor is a huge issue in a lot of um, third world countries, for lack of a better word. So for this training, for me, it was, okay, thinking, you know, where did my clothes come from? Are the things that I'm buying supporting killing um, in other ways, either through kind of um, catastrophes like factories burning down or this slow, long process of underpaying people or overworking people to the point that they might commit suicide or um, not be able to support themselves or their families. So I had this kind of surface understanding where, okay, I'm not committing murder where I could, you know, get in trouble for it legally, but Spiritually, um, how could I think of ways that I was contributing to 
probably killing somebody or at least making somebody suffer. Um, with animals, it was a similar thought. You know, it's impossible to um, not kill, unfortunately. And by that I mean that there are beings in everything that we breathe, that we drink, that we eat, um, and we do have to sustain ourselves. But I had kind of an epiphany when I was seven years old. <laughs> I was pretty lucky, I guess, but I grew up on an island where um, sometimes you'd catch your own food, and I remember vividly um, my family had a chicken that we had in the yard, and it was kind of the kid's job to like chase it around the yard and grab it, and then an adult would come over and throw like a pot over it, and then they would kind of wrestle and make sure that the pot would cover right at the neck so that the head was like sticking out and the body was in the pot. Um, and then when the adults asked my cousin, okay, it's your turn, and so I watched my cousin like take a knife and chop a chicken's head off, blood spurted, spurted everywhere. Um, and you can hear in the pot the chicken's body still flapping, still reacting to um, not being attached to a brain anymore. Um, and so for me, that was kind of a moment where I really considered what influence or what effect I was having on other um, beings, living beings in particular, and also to reevaluate my relationship um, with what I eat and with food. So to think for myself, was it necessary to do this kind of thing in order to survive, or could I find a different way? Or was I kind of pushing it behind me or out of view by maybe not doing it myself, but supporting either a factory that does this thing to millions of animals um, daily? And so it was more of like a question of understanding and um, reflecting and seeing, you know, how can I do something in a way that feels right for me and feels like I'm not constantly putting myself in that same situation with the chicken. And then that leads to plants. So if I'm vegetarian, then I have to eat something. Um, and so people have asked me, oh, you're a vegetarian, you have to kill plants, like plants want to live, kind of in an accusatory way, but um, I accepted the fact that you know, I do have to take the life of a plant in order to survive. But it's not only about whether to take a life or not to take a life, but to think of what's behind that for me and why am I doing something um, and how am I doing it? Am I doing it responsibly? Am I doing it out of greed? Um, and then for minerals, to think of water, to think of other things. I am so sorry, I hmm. forgot to inform you that a speaker would have three to five minutes. So <laughs> 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 oh, this, this is the first time I do it, so please uh, bear with me. <laughs> And so uh, when it uh, gets to one minute left, I will <laughs> do this so that you know that you need to wrap up. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> um, and so I just paid attention to how it was that I was taking in whatever minerals. It might be water, for example. Um, so how am I treating the water in my environment? Am I polluting it or not? Because that's something that I also have to take in. And so, really quickly, <laughs> on the second part, um, it's also about um, protecting the lives of other human beings ideologically. So, to kind of see and look into myself how my anger or my fear of somebody might manifest itself um, with our, as aversion, kind of like we heard in the Dharma talk today, 
are there people or groups of people that I try to push away or don't want to look at or don't want to see and that taken to an extreme um, which I have a lot of experience witnessing in my home country um, can easily turn into um, genocide or just killing of groups of people that we don't want to see or we don't understand. Um, so for me especially, the unfortunate side of experiencing um, discrimination yourself is that, for me at least, I develop this fear of that person or that type of people and in some ways that I mirrored the same feelings that they had towards me. I didn't want to see people like that. I didn't want to be around people like that. I didn't want to look like people like that or talk like people like that. And that's something that I've definitely been working with with this training to cultivate non-discrimination, to see how the way that I was treated kind of turned me into the kind of person that I didn't want to be. Um, and so I think reverence for life, the mindfulness training anyway, gives us a lot to think about in terms of what it is that we're doing to other people, um, as well as to ourselves in a way that causes suffering. So not just a superficial, you know, I am here and, and I haven't hurt anybody, but what are the ways that either I can see or I can't see that I allow myself to think of people in a lesser way or to treat the environment or the people around me as if they're not important. Um, so I think this training allows us to come back to ourselves and to see how it is that we either revere life or treat it as something that is not that important. the second mindfulness training, true happiness. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing, and oppression, I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others and I will share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. That true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion, and that running after wealth, fame, power, and sensual pleasures can bring much suffering and despair. I am aware that happiness depends on my mental attitude and not on external conditions, and that, and that I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on Earth and reverse the process of global warming. So, I was the last to choose the uh, training, so it was the last to, to take. <laughs> <laughs> so.
so but uh, it's happiness so that's that's cool <laughs> I have many stories about true happiness and I would like to to be sure to have my five minutes so <laughs> I will begin without all the jokes that I have <laughs> so um, the brothers and sisters asked us to, to, to find a link with uh, our theme of the retreat, Transform Habits, loving, uh, loving Ourselves and Healing Society. And I would like to talk to you about one of uh, my experiences, that's my life. Uh, 13 years ago, uh, I committed uh, multiple uh, suicide attempts and uh, uh, 13 years ago, exactly, I was in the hospital for that, and I was really bad at this moment. Uh, I was uh, so sad, and I felt that I was uh, useless in the society, and uh, my best idea was to just say to my parents, I want to kill myself, just, just to give you the opportunity to be together with love. And I was so suffering at this moment, just, just I was, uh, I had no occasion to, to speak with someone and to feel some, something into me. Um, that's the worst part of my story. <laughs> and years later, I was happy to, uh, to, to go to uh, the Maison de l'Inspire. Monastery, a monastery close to Paris with only sisters. And I discovered that I can open myself to my suffering. And uh, years and years after, uh, four years ago, uh, I discovered that I could bring my energy to the others. And that was maybe two or three months after my first retreat in Plum Village. And I remembered that I was, during this summer, asking myself, oh, I want to do something different in the society. I want to do, I want maybe to be a volunteer. I want to do a lot of things. But I, I, I was just in my mind at this moment. And uh, I told my, my wife that uh, it could be interesting to go in prison, but I was afraid by that, to, to bring... Uh, my energy to help people who were in prison. And uh, she helped me to, to find a group uh, in the Paris area. And uh, I had the occasion, the chance this year, uh, that year, to, to go in a prison to bring um, activities, uh, art, uh, art uh, activities. And uh, the same year, I have the chance to help an uh, old woman, Miss Martz, and uh, that was a chance, really a chance, because I have two gifts for me. The first gift was to know people who were in jail and to discover my own jail, and the second one with uh, old Miss Martz, who was uh, 90 uh, or 89 at this moment and to discover my grandmother and to discover that I could be linked with uh, all people who were like uh, always grumpy and say, oh, I'm not happy of the life and all this stuff. And this was a chance for me just to connect because it was not possible with my grandmother. And I discovered uh, that your love, uh, sharing and just that I, I was so important in life. I knew that before that, but not that way, and it was like a gift and gifts. And three years ago, I decided to, to go to Montreal to join my wife. She was in Montreal uh, one year before me. And uh, I stopped what I did in France. I was numismatist. I was expert in ancient coins and a PhD student in history. I was a teacher at university during three years, and uh, I stopped all of that without finishing my thesis. And I just told myself, what you want to do for you now? 
you have your time to heal from your depression. So now what do you want really for you? And my answer was clear. I want to bring meditation in prisons. And I began uh, a bachelor in criminology and then I began volunteer things. I will, prof I will enjoy my last minute uh, with the, la the, the, the rest of the story, but it will be enough. Um, I discovered during these three years uh, how to be volunteer in my, in my city, uh, Montreal, and to bring meditation with inmates. Uh, I found a group uh, for that, to bring meditation with, uh, in the house of transition, and then now with youth drug addict. And I can say now that my practice is totally different. Yes, I can meditate, that, that's true. Uh, I could meditate uh, uh, when I began nine years ago. But now I understand well what I have into myself that I want a profound link with the other. And when I bring meditation with the other, I have to have a great practice in myself. I have to know myself well, because when you are with inmates or drug addict people, they know all your failures. They, they like to touch <laughs> every part, and it's necessary to, to be honest with every traumatic part of myself. And uh, I found during these three years a new way to, to be involved in my meditation and I can say to finish that uh, I'm very grateful uh, of these mindfulness trainings uh, who brings me openness and, and happiness. Yes, I can say now I'm happy. Now I'm happy because I finished. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Thai, dear friends, true love, aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I am committed to cultivating responsibility and learning ways to protect the safety and integrity of in individuals, couples, families, and society. Knowing that sexual desire is not love and that sexual activity motivated by craving always harms myself as well as others. I am determined not to engage in sexual relations without true love and a deep long-term commitment made known to my family and friends. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to prevent couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. Seeing that body and mind are one, I am committed to learning appropriate ways to take care of my sexual energy and cultivating loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness, which are the four basic elements of true love, for my greater happiness and the greater happiness of others. Practicing true love, we know that we will continue beautifully into the future. So I was very <laughs> hesitant to agree to be on the five mindfulness trainings. But I had a conversation um, on Wednesday um, that really <laughs> gave me some, some material to talk about. And a dear friend asked me the question, since I've been here, have I been on Tinder? <laughs> <laughs> since I've been here, have I been on Tinder? <laughs> Tinder, Tinder is a dating app, by the way, in case nobody knows. But so, uh, um, so after I recovered from slight shock and <laughs> uh, avoided the obvious answer, um, it really made me think about when I was on Tinder and dating apps. 
and how when I use those apps, um, I wasn't really thinking about my body and mind together. So it was just kind of a body bodily satisfaction. So I know that my body could been could have been satisfied, but I never asked myself if my mind was being satisfied. And I like how this retreat is focusing on um, habit energies and looking more deeply into that. And I didn't realize that I, I wasn't giving myself the, the nourishment that I needed. Like I only thought it was instant and I didn't need anything else. And I think when I, if I would have had this training um, back when I was dating a few years ago, it would have give, given me pause to think about my ideals, like what I wanted out of a partner. Um, where my aspirations lied, um, and how, if I had a partner, how we can grow together. And I don't think an 85% match on screen <laughs> allowed me to do that, and nor a picture. So I think this is a really good training to, to really look at both body and mind and see that, like it says, um, in the middle of the training, that they are one, they're not separate, and to treat them that way. So I think I'd be. The fourth mindfulness training, loving speech and deep listening. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful speech and the inability to listen to others, I am committed to cultivating loving speech and compassionate listening in order to relieve suffering and to promote reconciliation and peace in myself and among other people, ethnic and religious groups and nations. Knowing that words can create happiness or suffering, I am committed to speaking truthfully, using words that inspire confidence, joy, and hope. When anger is manifested in me, I am determined not to speak. I will practice mindful breathing and walking in order to recognize and to look deeply into my anger. I know that the roots of anger can be found in my wrong perceptions and lack of understanding of the suffering in myself and in the other person. I will speak and listen in a way that can help myself and the other person to transform suffering and see the way out of difficult situations. I am determined not to spread news that I do not know to be certain and not to utter words that can cause division or discord. I will practice right diligence to nourish my capacity for understanding, love, joy, and inclusiveness, and gradually transform anger, violence, and fear that lie deep in my consciousness. I was born um, at a very young age in a family that I would <laughs> that I would describe as communicationally challenged. Um, so I learned great habits like how to suppress my emotions, how to exert power through anger, and how to shut down when I didn't know how to say what I wanted to say. 
I also grew up in South America where um, gender roles are very clearly defined and very unhealthily defined. So as a straight brown male, I'm not supposed to speak emotion because that's weakness and you must always be strong. Mm. So I kept bottling up stuff. I went like that for 20 years or more. And I saw many family members break down emotionally. I saw myself break down emotionally. I got sick. Um, then through a long story that won't fit five minutes, I came to a point when I said, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm done living this way. Um, the first time I found myself in a Dharma sharing group, my reaction was, what's wrong with you people? Why are you talking about this stuff, these like super intense things, like it's a Netflix show? What's, what's happening? <laughs> right? This trending is what's wrong with them. So then deep listening and loving speech became the only thing I could think about because I knew I needed to heal all the anger and shame and fear and sorrow and pain that I had been carrying for so many years. And the first person that I had to learn how to communicate with was myself. Um, and as I learned to talk to myself and to like pry out all these very painful and very real emotions that I've been keeping inside, as I healed them through meditating and sangha and all the things that you've been learning in this retreat. Something strange started to happen. Strange. Um, I started noticing how toxic my connections were to people. Um, and as I shifted, I saw how those connections broke because they depended on a dynamic, on a, they depended on a pattern that I was part of when I stepped out of it. They broke. And then some people just disappeared. They vanished from my life. Some people noticed and changed with me. And I also started seeing people that had this thing that I now had, this way of talking, this way of listening. And I created new bonds that I carry and keep building today. Mm. Everyone was there all the time. Nothing changed, but when I changed, everything changed. Mm. I come from a country where for 20 years we've been going through what the U.S. is starting to go through now. Um, where our leaders are very skilled at triggering fear and anger on both sides to keep us busy so they can profit. Um, where we have failed as a society, and I see we Venezuelans, is in observing that there's no such thing as the other side. The same anger and the same fear are being triggered. They just have different names. And our leaders are not the problem they are a consequence, they are a reflection of who we are as a country. Um, the only breakthrough we've been able to make as a society is when someone on either side uh, chose to reach out across the road. Not to say, let me tell you how I'm right, but to say, let me make you feel understood. Let me really listen to you and see what's going on. Mm. And I think we need a lot of that now, here too. To the question of how do I help others, I, this is one of the answers that I like the most from this practice is you don't. You help yourself and the healing overflows. So as I try to figure out how to change uh, 
society or my country or this one or anywhere I am. Uh, as I think we all, we are the only ones, like we're here now, there's no one else, right? So we have to kind of take on it. Uh, what I'm trying out is I don't try to change others. I just change myself and let the change overflow because it starts in the mirror. It doesn't happen over there. It happens here. Dear community, dear Thai, um, I will read the five, fifth mindfulness training. <laughs> um, nourishment and healing. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I am committed to cultivating good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, in my society by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I will practice looking deeply into how I, con I consume the four kinds of nutrients, namely edible foods, sense, sense impressions, volition, and consciousness. I am determined not to gamble or to use alcohol drugs, or any other products which contain toxins, such as certain websites, electronic games, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. I will practice coming back to the present moments to be in touch with the refreshing, healing, and nourishment, nourishing elements in me and around me, not letting regrets and sorrow drag me back into the past, nor letting anxieties, fear or craving pull me out of the present moment. Hmm. I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness and anxiety or other suffering by losing myself in consumption. I will contemplate interbeing and consume in a way that preserves peace, joy, and well-being in my body and consciousness and in the collective body and consciousness of my family, my society, and the earth. So, yeah. I, I would like to share with you how I practice this mindfulness training because um, I do consume sometimes unmindfully. <laughs> and, um, but um, what I've learned with the five mindfulness trainings is that I have the possibility to be mindful um, about what I, my intake, I, I have divided this intake, like what do I take into my mind and what do I take, um, what do I feed my body with and what do I feed my mind with. So this, this training, I think it, it involves a lot, a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of commitment. Um, so I try to be mindful about um, what I feed my mind, which is mainly the language. That's what I've been thinking about, the 
this on this retreat, and I've heard a lot of um, talks about language and the meaning of words. And I don't think it's only words. I think it's images, the images I see on the streets, uh, streets back in Mexico where I'm from, and uh, like all the advertisements and everything. So <clears throat> just try, just being mindful about that and um, the language that I use on myself, <laughs> the um, self-hatred we were talking about before, um, that is not uh, nourishing or healing towards me. And um, as it was said, I think that my best, the best way I can help the communities by being well myself before I can try and help other people. So just try to heal myself through that. And also um, just be compassionate with my body. As some of you might know, I, I cook vegan cakes. <laughs> I sell vegan cookies. And um, so I try to be vegan. <laughs> I'm not 100% vegan, but um, that's when I eat, I, I am mindful because it's my career. So I'm thinking about food all day long. And uh, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I could make a cookie with this. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, I try to be I'm mindful about that. Like sometimes I'm eating a fish like this weekend I ate some salm and I was like, okay, but was it free range? Even though if it wasn't, just to be, just to try and see things the way they are. What am I consuming? Uh, when I'm buying a one euro t-shirt, I'm like, what am I consuming? Dollar, I'm sorry. What am I consuming with this? Like, it's uh, the suffering we spoke about before. And there's also a lot of Good, um, good ways. I believe I love buying organic food, which uh, respects the farmers back in Mexico, which um, sometimes are not so well respected. And I think all jobs should be respected. So I try to go with them. And um, yeah, I just try to do exercise and um, Oh, and, and drinking. It's sometimes I drink. <laughs> I mean, I presented myself as an experienced lover, you know. So sometimes I'm just like in the thrill of life and this party comes up and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, of course I'm going to go. But um, as well, it's back to being mindful. It's like, now I know I have the option of saying no sometimes. Like there's no one to please but me because I am a big people pleaser and I was even more before. So now I know I'm able to say like, no, thank you very much. And when I do it, just like be aware of that. And thank you. So <laughs> yes, I think that's the way I try to practice this mindful training. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inspiring practice. I wish that we could give them half an hour for each person. And I feel very, very sorry because I am like Sophia, I'm a people's pleaser type. <laughs> so this is very difficult for me to, to do this, you know. <laughs> so I thought, okay, another minute, another two minutes. <laughs> very difficult. So anyway, we've, I've come through that difficult moment. So it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention and uh, the only comfort I, uh, I found is because we would like to give you some time for questions 
And uh, in the end, maybe uh, uh, I could talk to you a little bit about how you want to receive them formally. Um, so I guess it's about time that we can, uh, um, can give the floor to you so that you can put your hand up if you have any questions. And just perhaps gently check your, um, what you register during your um, attention to, to our panelists here, and then how you feel now after you listen to their sharings and after, um, you know, um, I think maybe half an, uh, more than half an hour, uh, how are you now? And uh, you can raise your questions based on, on, uh, on how you feel right now. Yeah. And our, uh, our friend Ellie, she will help to write the questions on the board so that we could... Uh, I think we uh, started quite late, so I'm not sure if, uh, if it's okay just to stay back like 10 minutes or so, because ideally we could finish at 9 o'clock. But I hope we can have another 10 minutes or so so that our panelists can address the questions. So how many questions should we have? Four, four questions? So at least make good use of your time. <laughs> Hi, can it be questions about um, specific things inside one of the trainings and how to do it? Okay. It's a little awkward to say, but I'm just going to say it. Um, I'm wondering what are some ways to take care of our sexual energy that aren't participating in sexual acts. Um, I know I've heard so far in the retreat they've talked about using it in other ways, and I'm just curious what those ways are. Like, obviously, you can go for a run or work out or have a conversation with someone, but it's a lot different than the actual act that we are kind of born to recreate. So. Anything, yeah, that'd be great. Maybe we take more questions before we uh, we address them. My question <clears throat> relates to Bradley's presentation on reverence for life. I really appreciated how he went through each of the categories mentioned, people, animals, plants, and minerals. Um, like Bradley, I've been a vegetarian vegan for a long time since I was young also. But my question is, if we... <laughs> Are we in some ways creating a hierarchy of living beings or living things when we say like people, animals, plants, and minerals? Um, because it was very clear, like Bradley spoke about people and animals and the ways in which we knowingly or unknowingly contribute to suffering, but maybe because you didn't have much time, you didn't get a chance to speak about plants and minerals. And I was just thinking like, you know, we say like, oh, I'm sorry, do you have to eat plants? Do I have to eat something? But does it mean, is it because we value it less? Or is it because um, scientifically we know that plants, we don't know whether or not it has a consciousness to suffer. And because we're not inducing suffering, does it make it easier to, or better because we need some sort of nourishment and I would love to have heard you either elaborate on it or hear what other people on the panel might have to say about that. Um, I'm a little close there. 
I also wanted to address Bradley. Uh, first, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was very eye-opening for me to hear the different ways on which you held yourself accountable, even though you aren't directly responsible for certain actions, to see how you still might be contributing to those. So that, I found that helpful. Um, I wanted to present to you and the brothers and sisters one argument I've heard. Um, it's kind of the only argument against uh, veganism from a moral standpoint that I can understand, and it's kind of more an intellectual exercise. I just wanted to present and see uh, what people's response to it is. And it would be to imagine a scenario where you have um, an industry that's creating animals for food, essentially. So these animals exist, and they would not exist if it were not for um, the market for food being raised in a sustainable way, having a good life, uh, environmentally responsible, a price that reflects the carbon uh, and is used to remove that from the atmosphere. And essentially, they live a good, normal life without hormones or modification to grow faster. And then at the end, uh, they're killed and eaten. If their life and their existence, if their whole time is pleasurable and that outweighs the suffering of the, the death, is it still an immoral act in that scenario to consume animals? And yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but the panelists who uh, talked about true happiness. Um, I would love if you told us more about your experience in the prison, in the prisons that you work in, and just what you do with the, inma in the inmates, um, and how you incorporate mindfulness with your job there. That's kind of a lot, right? Do you want more? <laughs> One more? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, mine uh, deals with more of the loving speech uh, stuff, um, and it's more about intent versus words, because I know that there's a lot of words, <laughs> but sometimes it's it's almost impossible to say something and not offend someone. Uh, and uh, I tend to do a lot of public speaking, and so I run into that a lot, where I'll be like, I say something and I'm trying to be cheeky and fun, and somebody comes up to me afterwards and be like, you should not ever say that again. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, so, but the intent is supposed to be loving. Um, so I guess I'm worried about the importance of intent. Uh, and then if it's, if the intent is, is loving, but the reaction is, is not loving, uh, is, is like resistance, how much, how much is it both of our, like our communication to deal with it? Like, is it, should we take our, our own, like if we react, uh, if we react like negatively to something, do we first have to look into ourself and go, okay, why am I really mad? Or is that my thing? Should, should I just work harder at being like, all right, Use your words, Jimmy. Use your words. So, yeah. I'll just read them out so our panelists and everyone can hear them. So, taking care of sexual energy, question mark. By putting people first, do we give less value to animals, plants, and minerals? 
Can you imagine a scenario where killing animals is moral? More about mindfulness and inmates? How do we balance our intent with our impact? Are we responsible for both? I hope I summarize your questions. Okay. Dear friends, um, so I told Mimi I'd actually like to say a little bit about the first question. Um, it just resonated with me a little bit. Um, so I know Ty talks about um, three kinds of energy sometimes. Um, spiritual energy, um, physical energy, and sexual energy. I think I got that right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think emotional is one of them. <laughs> but anyway, the point is um, that when I think of that question, I think of the third mindfulness trainings, it kind of reframes the way that I think about that aspect of um, sexuality. So the same way that, for example, um, I might feel tired or I might feel the um, motivation to stay up late um, when I'm able to recognize that and kind of do something about it that's more wholesome in terms of following this line of like um, action and consequences then it's easier to handle so with sexual energy um, sometimes for me it's similar to handling like a strong emotion like anger or um, sadness or fear where I kind of like say to myself um, you know I breathe in and I'm like I know that um, I have a lot of sexual energy right now um, breathing out um, it's okay <laughs> breathing in it's okay to have this energy breathing out I promise to take care of that energy. So that just, first of all, stops me from doing something just like, oh, I have this feeling and now I need to go to this website or talk to this person or do something that's kind of just like a knee-jerk reaction. But it gives me space to um, think about what's happening. Um, and then somehow that makes it kind of easier to redirect the flow of, I think of it like um, changing the course of a river where I can then choose to do something else. Um, why am I feeling this way? Is it because I'm alone and I don't want to be alone? Is it because I'm bored and I don't want to be bored? So if I'm alone, then maybe I can go spend time with a friend doing something instead of something else. Or if I'm bored, maybe I can read something. So for me, it's kind of just... Um, looking into what's happening and seeing if it's coming from a place of this deep need to do this and I won't be satisfied unless I do this or is it coming up because I'm trying to um, cover up something else or I have nothing else to think about. Dear Thai, dear friends, so I googled this question a lot <laughs> for many, many months and I could never find a concrete um, explanation on how to channel, channel sexual energy. Um, and I think what Bradley shared about acknowledgement and not repressing, so breathing with it was really helpful. Something that um, I have been aware of since coming to the monastery is how closely related my body and my mind are. So what is triggering the sexual energy? Is it, has it been a physical touch or is it my mind and fantasies? And so um, with mind and fantasies, I, 
I noticed like if I'm like building a fantasy and in the past it, I had built it up so far where then I would become aroused um, and then go to Tinder. <laughs> so um, I think now when I'm noticing my train of thought uh, starts to go that way, I don't um, embellish the fantasy and that really helps to not trigger the body to become aroused. But I know um, this is also a question like with people in relationships, um, like what if your partner has more sexual energy or less than you do? And I think that was a big issue in uh, my past relationships. And I think like really um, coming back to the practice would have been helpful for me um, to really see if it was the appropriate time and if my partner had the space to engage. But I think acknowledgement, um, not repressing, not embellishing, um, and also like running. <laughs> I don't know, I don't run, but running, <laughs> art, I don't, I don't do art either. But I think those things also would be helpful, but uh, really paying attention to what the mind is doing. Is, is it the mind that is triggering the body or is it something else? Thank you. So I will share more about mindfulness and inmates. Um, there is a book of Thai called um, Be Free Where You Are, uh, if I remember well. In French, it's Soyez Libre Là Où Vous Êtes. And uh, it's a teaching in prison. So that's why, that was the first step for me to discover that practice mindfulness in prison was possible. What I found in prisons was a great opening to, to the practice because people in prison, they have a lot of time and they have uh, little spaces. So they, are really, they, they really enjoy that people from outside go to see themselves and practice meditation together. For my part, I practice some, when I have enough time uh, for that, uh, I practice three times a month in a penitentiary close to Montreal. And um, it's a great practice. It's like a, a new sangha. Uh, can you imagine that you, you, you are with friends where many volunteers to go to prison and we practice in, in a medium security uh, penitentiary. So that's a penitentiary. It's a, a high level of security. But can you imagine that you are with people talking about everything and just practicing a 30 minute silent meditation, walking meditation, and then sharing together each other and then eating a cake that they do. <laughs> so that's like to be in a, sang a normal sangha. It's like people who are suffering together who want to find something into themselves to be more connected with the others. Um, in the in the penitentiary close to Montreal, close to the one where I, I go, there were um, a vipassana retreat, a ten days retreat, in Salant. and that was very interesting because uh, we had some of these guys coming to the group, and I I felt that they were so happy to exchange with people, and that the change there the capacity, their the, the practice. I practice with a group in other tradition, but it's very close that we do here in the Plum Village, in the Blue Cliff Monastery. And um, uh, I was asking uh, uh, one, weeks ago, one week ago to participate to a program to maybe implement a meditation program for all the penitentiary in Canada. So the mentalities ev uh, evolved, and uh, that's very great that people, uh, that the organizer think that there is more possibility uh, with meditation. And I can just finish in saying that 
I was interviewing uh, an our um, ex inmate, a woman, and she told me uh, she she was reading um, the book uh, Buddha and Jesus are brothers, and she told me that was one of the most favorite books when she was in prison, and she told me I learned in prison how to heal and how to be free with meditation. And that touched me a lot. I was like, okay, wow, okay. So now I can be more connected to my own prison and maybe try to be free in myself. So that's a great way to, to be a volunteer in this kind of place. Well, <clears throat> address the last question. How to balance our intent with our impact when communicating and where does responsibility lie? I think the key element to consider here is empathy, um, both pre and post communication. Uh, communication always has two sides. And if I am saying something, because I think that's what you're asking about, um, I need to empathize with I need to meet the person that I'm talking to at the place where they're at. Uh, so being aware of my intention is super important, right? But the same word means many different things for many different people. If I don't understand, if I'm talking to you and I don't understand where you are, then a word will mean something different. Uh, and it may be offensive to you. Uh, that being said, there is no way for me to know your full story. And uh, then I also post communication when I, this happened to me a lot when I moved to the US because I had no idea what PC culture was and Venezuela is completely on PC, right? There's no, everything is funny and, and like it's all, uh, Everything has like a double sense. It's just, it's insane. Uh, so whenever I spoke here at the beginning, I offended everyone I could possibly offend all the time. <laughs> Awareness of where people were at with words that re regarded race, for example, that is a big issue here. That's, it is an issue for us, but it's kind of covered into money and, and class structure. Uh, I had to become very aware of what race meant in this country so I could speak in a way where I could still say what I wanted to say without offending anyone. But also, there's a limit to that because everyone is fighting their own battle, right? And if you carry a lot of suffering around race, I could say the slightest thing and that's going to trigger something because you're overflowing with suffering. So when there's a negative reaction, I always ask, how can I attune my understanding of your situation better, but also what is happening over there that I have no control over? And uh, I only am responsible for the first side, what I want to say, why I want to say it, and how I understand where you're at, how you react, that's up to everyone else. Yeah. And we all love talking about sex. So I'm going to, a short comment on question one, uh, echoing uh, what you guys have shared. There's two questions that I always ask myself when I don't know what to do about sexual energy. Because um, I think about the intention behind the training. Um, past the logistics of like, do this or don't do that, because I was brought up Catholic, so I don't react well to this is how you should behave. But I think very much about the intention, which is healing, transformation, uh, upgrading habits to positive versions of them. The questions I have myself are, what is a loving thing to do? And is this good for both of us? The first one really makes me touch into 
what do I really need? What am I looking for, like both of you mentioned? Like, is this, am I looking for attention or am I looking for connection? Uh, sometimes the answer to that question for me, trying to overcome shame, goes straight up against what's on this paper. But it's very well aligned with the intention of healing. But along the lines of communication, there's someone else, right? So maybe what's good for me is bad for that person. So if it's not good for both of us, it shouldn't be. I will find a different space and then I can go running or writing or all the options that, you, that the internet suggests, right? Um, <laughs> but um, for me, always finding out the answer to those two questions is very helpful in how to deal with it. Uh, talking to the Buddha inside, right? Uh, not to what societal, society expects of me back home or here. Uh, but also always considering the same questions for the other person, which is as important, because the other person is as important as I am, no less and no more. I um, got really touched by a question. Um, so maybe it was not directed at me, but <laughs> since that's mainly what I do. So can you imagine a scenario where killing animals is moral? So I, I just wanted to say first thing that came to mind is I cannot imagine a scenario where I could kill an animal, less a mammal. You know, I feel so identified with cows and pigs. <laughs> I, it's just so much suffering for the animal. Um, like in animal farms, um, that's one thing that I do when I'm um, to try to consume, to do mindful consumption, is to inform myself of what it is I'm buying. And um, when I watch uh, documentaries on like slaughterhouses and the whole animal food industry, it's just, it's really sad for me. And they suffer a lot. Like, um, even, even in the case that um, they, even like free range cows that eat organic grass, they create so much methane and CO2. I don't know which one of those it is, but there's one that creates more than the whole, um, transport system in the world, like animal agriculture affects more than the whole transport system. <laughs> I got this from Cowspiracy, a documentary I recommend <laughs> a lot, <laughs> just to get the fact. <laughs> and um, so that's just not a viable way of doing it and uh, just to wrap it up, I, the way I see it, is so why would I want to consume something which so much suffering in it as it is? I, I don't feel bad. I don't want to cry when I grab um, a leaf out of a lettuce in the ground and I, I grab it and I eat it. I'm, like, I'm not feeling I want to cry because I'm so sorry for the lettuce. <laughs> I think the lettuce is happy, like, yes, I'm doing my I'm function or whatever. <laughs> but like, oh my God, the story of the chicken <laughs> you told, I would be like, oh, so, so sad. And so, yeah, I, for me, it's a really obvious answer. Thank you. I hope the community can let me share shortly on just, I just want to address everyone's question. Um, 
Thank you, Sophia, for sharing. Um, so, um, just quickly, by putting people first, do we give less value to other um, beings? Um, that wasn't my intention in uh, explaining it the way I did, so hopefully um, I can clarify that a little bit, um, because I've thought about that as well. Um, so it's interesting, I'm happy that we're doing garden work, um, because um, my family here is doing work in the garden and I have a garden at home. And by working in the earth, I'm pretty fortunate to kind of see how all four of these beings interact. Um, when you're like planting, or when I'm planting, for example, just the very act of sticking a shovel into the earth <clears throat> sometimes catches or snags some earthworms. Um, and when I do that, it actually makes me very sad. Um, and I was also thinking about um, weeding and that process and how I've kind of decided which plants are good so you get to live and I'll take care of you, but you guys, like, you're out. <laughs> um, and to see, like, with minerals, like, what you put in the soil affects the plants, which in turn affects the animals, which in turn affects the people. So for me, at least, it's kind of seeing how all four of them interact together. Um, yes, I recognize that there's the need to survive um, as well, and so when I choose to eat plants and not animals, there is this kind of distinction in my mind that um, an animal endures, if not more suffering, more obvious suffering um, than a plant, but I still keep in mind, or try to keep in mind, it's not then permission for me to raise a whole forest to plant vegetables or to grow things in a way that I'm being careless about the water sources or the chemicals that are going into it. Because at some point, I've noticed it all comes back together in some way, shape, or form, where people in communities where forests are destroyed get sick, where um, you can't grow vegetables in earth that's been polluted by nuclear waste or oil spills. So it's kind of, for me, this way of looking at how um, I interact with um, other beings in any of those forms um, and how really there isn't necessarily a separation because they all kind of affect one another. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, our panelists, for addressing um, the questions really wonderfully. So, shall we give them the flowers? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> flowers. I missed that out. <laughs> and um, so I, I guess you and I, we both ob observe that through the practice of our friends here, it reflects a lot of compassion and understanding in the way we practice the five mindfulness trainings. And the name of the training itself is mindfulness training. So you could see that this app is based on mindfulness. <laughs> so practicing this and using this app, you can be assured that your compassion and understanding is growing. And uh, tonight's presentation and sharing, we hope it is like an invitation and in, uh, to inspire you to explore further. And um, if you uh, feel inspired enough, to receive them formally. Um, then we will have a transmission ceremony. I don't, in the morning, do, yeah. And when do we uh, have the deadline for the application? Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Suko. Yeah. So um, the formality of it is that uh, uh, you can turn to the back of uh, the sheet you have in your hand. There's the application form. And if you feel you want to just to practice them without the formality, then by all means, please do so. But if you feel like you want to have the support of the Sangha and commit yourself in a formal way, then you can fill the application and return it by um, return it uh, to your um, Dharma sharing facilitator in um, uh, in the last Dharma sharing, which is Saturday afternoon. Um, and uh, as you see, our teachers actually our teacher actually had put it in the way that helped us to to bring the awareness into the suffering, and we feel inspired to do this or to refrain from doing some certain things. Um, so it's not something like you don't do that, as uh, Louis shared before. If you don't do that, then... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, also... Um, when you, um, when you receive the five mindfulness trainings formally, it doesn't mean that you walk out of the ceremony and then you suddenly become like, wow, you know, wholesome person, everything is great. <laughs> so you go home and you feel like, okay, you know, okay, you, you, you're not eating vegetarian. <laughs> I am eating vegetarian or, or, or this and that. Um, I, I feel that uh, personally, I feel that if we just do it in a, in, a, in a humble way, we receive them, we find that they are meaningful for us and we put them into practice, we just do it in a subtle and quiet and, and humble way, then our energy will start changing and then people will start noticing that and we, we, you will become an inspiration to other people like before you always Okay, have to, to say the last words. Now you refrain from saying it, and people say, "Okay, what what happened to you?" And they will <laughs> and they will have a question mark, and you can share with them what what make the the change in you. I find that's always the best way to inspire to inspire people to practice rather than the way I did. I copy Thai talk ten. Cat set tapes at that time, and I gave it to my friend, and it didn't work. <laughs> so, um, so I I guess uh, the time is um, um, up. So I once again want to thank our friends for very being very generous in your your time, your your energy, and your resources to share with us all your in, inspirational practices. Thank you. One, one last comment. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about these things, um, not because I know a lot, but because getting asked about them forces me to figure them out. So if anyone wants to talk to me about anything, I'm always happy to kind of like work on it together. Maybe we have more questions, both, and then we figure them out. I want just to, to add something that uh, the brother at Treasure shared me when I took the five mindfulness trainings. He told us that uh, it was um, trainings, uh, uh, an entraînement pour. Uh, sorry. Uh, an entraînement à, à s'engager. A training to engage and an engagement to train. So that's not to follow all the lines word by word, but just to train to bring more and more what we can and what we can develop into ourselves. And so uh, tomorrow in the Dharma sharing time, if you still have something you like to discuss about this, that is your chance. And also we will have a Q&A session and you also can uh, bring your question there. Um, and I am once again, thanks for your patience and your, your tolerance because I know that I am quite clumsy. I uh, am very quite nervous. I practice, but I'm quite nervous also. My first time, and I um, I want to thank my brothers and sisters for staying and supporting us. 
uh, during the session. Have a nice sleep and see you in the morning. Mm. I will invite the trees after the bell so we can uh, enjoy our breathing and relax. Mm.